All right, so what we're going to be looking at in this lecture is the beginning of the second century, and I've called this century the Age of the Apostolic Fathers. And these, that particular title, what that means is people who wrote after the Apostolic Age, which is the Age of the Apostles. Um, so really what we're talking about is about the year 95 and maybe up through about 150. Um, these writings are um, almost all by men. In fact, I think all of them are by men, and it's, they're called the Apostolic Fathers. Now, a couple of things I want to focus on as we go through these next um, series of short lectures. Um, one focus will be on ecclesiology, and if you remember what that means is the structure of the church. So starting at the top with the, uh, the bishop and then going down to the priest and all the categories in between. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about eschatology. And if you remember, that means the end time, the study of the end times. So what I will do is I'm going to show you some texts. And what I want you to do is to, uh, like last time, turn off the video, uh, read the texts. And what I will do is I will include a tag on some of these texts so that you can read them online if you want to. Um, I'll give you the entire text or give you the link to the entire text online. Um, one thing I'm going to do, though, before we start off with looking at the Apostolic Fathers is talk a little bit more about persecution, because there's um, a really important um, series of sources on early Christian persecution starting in the second century. And these are the letters, letters of um, Pliny the Younger, who um, became a governor in the northern part of Turkey, and Emperor Trajan. So they exchanged a series of letters. And then what we'll do is we'll start looking at uh, uh, two of the uh, first apostolic fathers, uh, Clement, and a writing called the Shepherd of Hermas. Okay, what I've got here is a letter from Pliny the Younger to Emperor Trajan. And Pliny wrote a series of letters. This one is um, letter 10.96. Um, and again, what I'd like you to do is to stop the video and then to read through this. Okay, and what you can see here, this letter is really important uh, for a number of reasons, but the, the main reason why I want to show you this is because it talks about some of the things that the Christians were doing during this period. So if you see, um, they are accustomed to meet on a fixed day uh, before dawn, they sing a hymn to Christ, and then they bind themselves to an oath to do good things. And then before they depart, they um, come together uh, and have food, which is order, ordinary and innocent food, according to Pliny. And you can also see here that he tortures some people to find out information about the Christians. And what's really about interesting about this is it's two female slaves who are deaconesses. So remember in one of the, the previous lectures, we talked about women and the roles they played in the early church. Here's some outside evidence that women did play a part in the hierarchy or the ecclesiology of the church. Now, we're lucky enough to have Emperor Trajan's reply. So again, why don't you stop the video, uh, read through the letter, and then I'll talk about it. Okay, so what you can see here is um, the Emperor wrote back to Pliny and said, these people should not be sought out. So if they come out and say they are Christian, then they will be punished. So that's what he says uh, in, this, in this letter. And what he does, these, the, the punishment should be death. Um, but they can have the chance to uh, repent. And what, they, what uh, Trajan is telling Pliny to do is that to repent and to prove it is that they have to worship the, the Roman gods. And then they'll get a pardon. Um, one really important thing here to note is that uh, Pliny had said in one of his letters that he was receiving anonymous tips saying some people are Christian. And the emperor says, ignore those. Um, there's no place um, in Roman law where um, accusations, anonymous accusations, should be taken seriously. And I really like this last bit of this particular letter, for this is both a dangerous kind of precedent and out of keeping with the spirit of our age. So that's a little bit of the correspondence between uh, Pliny and Trajan on persecution. Okay, now on to these apostolic fathers. So as I, <coughs> as I uh, said a little bit ago, these are early writers from about the year 90 AD to um, the middle part of the second century of the 100s. Um, traditionally, it's people who had some type of contact with these early apostles, either they knew them 
uh, were taught by them, or at least according to tradition. We'll start off talking about Clement of Rome, um, one of the earliest, earlier church leaders we have who lived in Rome. Um, <laughs> I'll talk about a writing called The Shepherd of Hermas. Um, and in the following lectures, I'll talk about the Didache, or the Teaching of the Twelve, um, the Epistle of Barnabas, and then we'll talk about another early Christian named Ignatius. Okay, in terms of Clement of Rome, we don't know a lot about him except for what we get in his letters. Now, I've given you a date here, 88 to 97, with a bunch of question marks. What those question marks mean is that we don't know if this is really when he was um, the Bishop of Rome. Um, I will stick a tag somewhere on this with a link to his writing, which is called First Clement. Um, according to his letter and some other sources that talk about uh, Clement, he might have been ordained by Peter himself, so Peter the, um, the Apostle of Christ, and it's possible that um, Clement was the third bishop of Rome. Uh, this will become important in a, a little bit when I talk about apostolic succession, um, or keeping a list of bishops, the official bishops of a certain city. Um, this text is extremely important because it's the earliest known text outside of the Christian, what we would call New Testament, which hasn't been formed yet, but it's the earliest one we have outside of that. Um, what's really interesting about this is that um, Clement wrote uh, uh, his, his letter to the Corinthians. And if you're familiar with the New Testament, Paul also does this. And Paul has quite a bit of trouble with the Corinthians. And uh, Clement is writing about similar problems. Um, he's also the very first one, and this is important for ecclesiology, um, to talk about the Bishop of Rome and how he himself is important enough to write to another Christian community. Um, in terms of the date, more than likely Clement is writing during the time of Emperor Domitian. If you remember, we talked about Domitian. He was the one who persecuted Christians, and Domitian ruled from 81 to 96, so sometime in this period. And we think because we think this is because um, at the very beginning of his letter, he says, owing dear brethren to the sudden and successive calamitous events which have happened to ourselves. Um, scholars think that this is referring to the persecution of Domitian. Um, not 100% certain, but we're, we're fairly certain. Um, in terms of ecclesiology, now some of this won't sound unusual because, of course, we're talking about like if we're talking about modern Christianity 2,000 years later, this is the way it's structured. But back in um, the late first century, early second century, they're just starting to develop their hierarchy or their ecclesiology. Um, no big surprise, you've got God at the top in terms of hierarchy from the top, followed by Jesus. You've got the apostles, you've got the bishops and the deacons, and then everyone else. And they're usually called the laity. Now, again, this doesn't sound surprising to us because this is how the church is structured or Christianity is structured today in uh, many of the de denominations. Um, one thing that Clement is writing to the Corinthians about is that they were trying to get rid of their bishops and deacons. And what Clement does is he writes back and says, once the bishops and deacons are chosen, it's not up to the common laity or the laity to make these decisions. And I just mentioned apostolic succession. That is the line of bishops from the very beginning, like from Christ to anointing these, these various apostles, and then these apostles anointing others to be bishops. This is really important. Um, here is the bit about apostolic succession. Sorry, my cat was trying to jump up. Um, and this is found in his letter, First Clement, chapter 44. And if you want to stop the video, you can read through this. And it's the bolded part that I want you to concentrate on. Okay, as you can see here, apostolic succession, according to Clement, is the apostles who knew Christ. Um, and these people appointed ministers and that people who follow after them are approved. And these, it's these people who should be the next bishops and the next deacons. So again, that's apostolic succession. And this becomes important because if you remember, we talked about these traveling prophets. They would go into these towns and sometimes they would set themselves up as leaders of the church. And so it's important to have people in a list. Sorry, my cat. Go on, go on. Um, 
Um, it's, people will come in and it's important to have a list of who the official people were who are leading the church. Okay, the next uh, text that I want to talk about is a really interesting one. It's called the Shepherd of Hermas. Um, Hermas, as far as we know from the letter, was a freedman. And what that means is he was once a slave and he was freed by whatever uh, method. We don't know exactly because he doesn't tell us. Uh, we know he was married. He had children. But he practiced abstinence, meaning he did not have sex with his wife, obviously, after they had their children. Um, what's also interesting about the shepherd of Hermas is that he was told to send his letter out to Clement, who we just talked about. Um, within the, the writing of the shepherd Hermas, you've got um, this basic breakdown. You've got these five visions, and I'll talk a little bit about some of these, what these visions say. You've got 12 commandments about what early Christians were supposed to be doing. And then you've got 12 similitudes or parables. Um, it's interesting, if you look at some of these visions, his vi first vision, he desired a woman, he was chastised for this. Um, what this is talking about is actually, it's obviously sexual desire. Um, in vision two, he talks about how his wife and children have sinned. And you can read a little bit about what he has to, has to say about his wife, um, for she does not restrain her tongue, which, uh, with which she commits iniquity, but on hearing these words, she will control herself and will obtain mercy. So this is part of his vision. And when you read the Shepherd of Hermas, you'll see um, an old woman speaking to him. Uh, this old woman is actually the church um, speaking to Hermas. Um, you get a lot of these sort of parables, analogies written into uh, these particular visions. And this one is really interesting. This is vision three. It's talking about the building of the church stone by stone. Um, and why don't you stop the video and read read through this and then I will talk about it. Okay, here you can see that Hermas is talking about 12 white stones that are being fitted together and they fit perfectly. And then here's the ecclesiology. It's the apostles, bishop, bishops, teachers, deacons, um, and these are the people who are chosen by God. So there you have a bit of ecclesiology in the Shepherd of Hermas. Um, you also have eschatology. So this is in Vision 4. This, again, is writing about the end times or what's going to happen at the very end. So why don't you stop the video um, and read through this. Um, if you're familiar with Revelation, some of this sounds very familiar. You've got a mighty beast like a whale. Out of its mouth come fiery locusts and, and so on. He's talking about the very end of time. And then the fifth vision is the appearance of the shepherd himself, and he's the one who's protecting Hermas in all of this. Um, if you read through the rest of Hermas, you can see there's commandments. And these are commandments um, that are given to Hermas. And of course, the whole reason for writing this down is to pass this on to Christians. So you have a couple of rules that are starting to be generated about Christian behavior. Um, clearly belief in one God, and then you've got all these other things, simplicity, confidence, good desires, and so on. So what this text is doing is teaching early Christians how to behave. And then you've got a list of parables, which I don't think I list, um, list here. And then Hermas doesn't quite understand these, so you get the shepherd telling him what these parables mean. Um, in terms of key, key ideas, now this text, again, is really important because it helps us uh, figure out what was happening in the early church and also tells us how early Christians were behaving. So here you can see baptism was the only way to enter the church. Um, Hermas does allow remarriage, remar but if you do remarry, then you shouldn't have sex and it's better to not get married in the first place and not have sex with anybody. Um, his Christology, which is the study of Christ, it's really interesting. He doesn't mention the name of Christ. He doesn't say Christ. He uses all these other titles, Savior, Son of God, Lord. Um, it's interesting, too, there's a little bit of confusion on what the Holy Spirit is. He calls the Holy Spirit the Son of God. This will be the case till uh, about the middle of the 300s when Christians really start focusing on what the Holy Spirit is. Uh, lots of early Christians really didn't deal with the Holy Spirit other than just naming it. Um, I put down here is his Trinity is God the Father. Uh, the Holy Spirit, which is the Son of God and the Savior. Um, what's really interesting is that Hermas seems to separate out um, 
the earthly savior with the heavenly savior. And here the human savior is adopted by, um, or is the adopted son of God. And then you've got his ecclesiology. Now, this is a little bit different than what you see in Clement of Rome and what we'll talk about in terms of this man named Ignatius. He doesn't stress the idea of one bishop per city. So uh, during the time of Hermas, where he was living, um, you could have multiple bishops controlling a city. Um, in terms of sources and information for the book of the Shepherd of Hermas, you've got a, uh, a little bit later uh, man writing a little bit later named Irenaeus, and we'll talk about him in just a bit. He wrote a book called Against Heresies, and he is quoting Hermas, and he calls it scripture. So if you remember early Christians, when they, when they said the word scripture, especially in the New Testament, it meant the Old Testament. Now you've got Irenaeus, who is an um, apostolic father. He's calling the Shepherd of Hermas a book, really, that everyone should, uh, should read. Um, you find the Shepherd of Hermas listed in one of the earliest um, lists of the New Testament we have called the Muratorian Canon. Um, this was written down around 200. Um, what the Muratorian Canon says about the Shepherd Hermas is that it's a writing that's orthodox or correct. There's correct belief found in the Shepherd of Hermas, but it's not canonical. What that means is it, it shouldn't be listed in the official books that Christians should be reading. Uh, it gives us a little bit more information about Hermas. And then um, we also found, find the, the text of Hermas in a very important um, old manuscript called the Codex Sinaiticus, which is written in the fourth century um, or the 300s. You also have um, a little bit later a, a writing of a Christian named Eusebius, and he writes this very important work called Ecclesiastical History. And what he does is he also mentions Hermas, um, called, the book is also called The Shepherd. And you can see here that what he says, and what you should probably do is stop the video and read through this. So I'll give you a second to do that. And what you can see here is Eusebius also says the same thing that we looked at um, previously. It can, can be read, it's orthodox, but some, some don't read it. And it's interesting here, he says, um, Hermas, as we know it, has been publicly read in churches. And he's found that some of the ancient writers have used it as well. And then finally, the last person we'll look at for evidence on the shepherd is a man named Athanasius. He was a North African um, a bishop, and he was writing in the middle, early middle 300s, and he talks about um, the shepherd. So you can see here that um, um, these later writings, and we'll talk about some of these, are just read. They're not included in the list of official books uh, to be read by early Christians, but they can be read but they're not in the same league as texts in the New Testament.